have your Bibles, turn with me to our scripture this morning. It's also printed in the bulletin. I'd rather you to read it from your Bible. It's a good habit to, to have to bring your Bibles to church. I heard the story of a train wreck one time. People were dying, and they asked this doctor to help. He said, I don't have my instruments. You need your instruments. You need to have the Word with you. Uh, Before I read the Scripture, I want to tell you two things to set the stage, and I'll be brief with it. Uh, A few years ago, I I heard of, and then I, I bought a copy of the book called Revolution. There was a story about one of the largest churches in our country. It may be the largest. It's called the Willow Creek Church. There are thousands of members of the Willow Creek Church, and they have many networks all across our country. The senior pastor uh, is Bill Heibel. His senior executive was a- asked him on one occasion as they were preparing a multi-million dollar budget for the church next year, he said, Bill, what, what are, kind of results are we getting for spending all of this money on ministry? And Bill said, well, that's an interesting question. How about doing a study and tell us? So he took the challenge, and he selected about 5,000 people who were connected with Willow Creek and placed them in four categories. The first category were those who attended but had not professed faith in Christ at this point. The second group were new Christians. The third group was maturing Christians. And the fourth group was older Christians. And they took them through an evaluation of Willow Creek's ministry. And what they found, as Bill Heibel later said, was revolutionary and changed their paradigm of ministry. What they found out was those not yet making a profession of their faith in Christ and the new Christians gave the church good marks on its preaching and teaching and discipleship. However, the maturing Christians and the older Christians were not as charitable. They said, the church is not discipling us. Uh, We do not know how to give a reason for the hope that's in us. And Bill Heibel said that was revolutionary for them to to hear that, and it did lead to an alteration of the paradigm of the ministry that went on there. So keep that in mind. And I mentioned to you before my friend Dr. Christian Smith, sociology professor now at Notre Dame University, talked to you about a youth study that he uh, was responsible for a number of years ago. Chris was also involved in another conference that was made up of Muslims, Jews, and Christians. The title of the conference was called Passing on the Faith, and all the lectures from that conference were later compiled and printed in a book called Passing on the Faith. What came out of that conference was an admission from all three religions that none of the three were doing a good job in passing on the faith to their children. But they determined that the Muslims were doing the best. And and as I read that, and of course, Chris, being out of our background, uh, encouraged me thinking along these lines. The interesting thing about that is the covenant theology that undergirds us, as we've been talking about, and the commitments that we make. The Christian religion should have been at the top of the list instead of at the bottom. I think that's a challenge to us to be very careful. Now, keep that in mind as as I read to you from our Scripture from the 8th chapter of Mark. Mark 8. I want to begin reading at the 10th verse. Hear the word of the Lord. And immediately he, Jesus, got into the boat with his disciples. And he went to the district of Dalmanutha. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them. And he got back into the boat and went to the other side. Now, 
they had forgotten to bring bread. And that was the disciples, the 12 disciples who were with Jesus on the boat. And they had only one loaf with them on the boat. And he cautioned them saying, watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing that you have no bread? Do you not perceive? Do you not yet understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes you do not see. Having ears you do not hear. And do you not remember when I broke five loaves for 5,000 with baskets full, how many pieces did you take up? And they said 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? May God bless this reading and our, our understanding of this passage of Scripture. Most of us are familiar with the little children's drawing books where it's the connect the dot kind of books where as you connect the dots, the picture begins to come into focus and you see what it is that those dots are all about. Sadly, I think there are a lot of people who profess to be Christians that have not yet connected the dots. But I want to give a kind of an optimistic spin on this for you this morning because of the nature of this passage of Scripture. I want to believe that more people than we might realize want to understand what it means to be a Christian. And to make a difference. And to make an impact in the name of Christ. I want to believe that. But I'm concerned at how expertly we become in learning how to compartmentalize our lives. We have our public life and we have our private life. We have that sacred part of our life and then we have that part that we called, but erroneously called, the secular part of our life. We believe in the natural, but we don't know how always to connect it with the supernatural. So we think dualistically about things. We do not know how to connect our work and our play. We don't know how to connect our religion, our faith with our family and other activities of our life. And we're facing a situation in America today where some are telling us that we're in the midst of a spiritual revival, if you can believe it. But the reality is that spiritual revival has nothing to do with Christianity. It's a spiritual revival that has its root in neo-paganistic interest in the supernatural, in the superstitious, and in the mysterious. Added to that, we're being told by so many that it's not politically correct for us to talk about our religion in public. It's okay for church and private, but not public. Because when we start talking about, to someone about our religion, the implication is our religion is right and your religion is wrong, and that's not acceptable by society's standards today. And you hear that on television. Some of the most popular religious speakers on television are not preaching about the God of the Bible. At least the way God says in His Word He wants us to preach about Him. So my friend Chris Smith, I think, was right on, as I told you before, by describing the, the typical religion of the American teenager as moralistic, therapeutic deism and responding to where they got it, if you remember from my telling you, 
They got it from their parents and other adults in the church and in the culture. There are many cultural analysts today who study the trends and say that most American people still believe in God or some spiritual being, however they define him or, or her. But they generally say you don't have to get too involved with this God. But if you got trouble, you can turn to this God, whomever he is, and call on him for help. And he may be there to meet some of the deepest needs of your life. Now, I wouldn't be as alarmed by what I'm saying to you by some of these statements if these analysts didn't also indicate that many of the people who say those things are church members. Somewhere there seems to be a disconnect between what God says in His Word about Himself, about life and reality, and what we believe or what we think we believe. Something should be happening that doesn't seem to be as a result of our faith in Christ. Dr. Robert Worthnow, who is head of the sociology department at Princeton University, he and his co-workers have done studies, and he's concluded that those who go to church regularly have not yet understood that Jesus is Lord, that He is Lord of all of life. And he said they can't connect what they hear on Sunday in church with how they live the rest of their lives during the week. And at best, again, following their, their conclusions, the spiritual part of life seems to be lacking in something to hold it together. A centerpiece from which we draw our energy. Consequently, one of the descriptions we're hearing today about people in their lives is they are fragmented, they are chaotic, and they are dislocated, disconnected from friends, feeling alone and isolated. You know, my friends, if we're in that state, if we're fragmented, if we feel disconnected, if, if our life feels chaotic, you know where you are? You're right where the devil wants you to be because he's got you in his control. He has. And he works best in that kind of situation. Now, another part of all this that disturbs me, particularly in light of this, this scripture that I just read, is there are professing Bible-believing Christians who can quote a lot of Scripture, but you don't have to talk with them long before you realize they don't know what it means. They don't know how to interpret it. They don't know how to apply it to their lives. And in thinking about this and the Scripture this morning, I think back over a quote that I gave you a couple of weeks ago. For those of you who were here, from the late Charles Malink, speaking at Billy Graham's dedication of Billy Graham's School of Communication. If you remember, the title of his message was The Twofold Challenge of Evangelicalism. And his twofold challenge was, one, <laughs> to save souls. And the second one was to save minds. And I mentioned that. But he goes on to say in that uh, message that he delivered that day, which I didn't quote, he said, the problem is not only to save souls, the problem is to win minds. He said, you can win the whole world, but if you fail to win the mind of the world, you will actually lose the world and lose the soul of the people. And when I connect these warnings with what a passage of Scripture like Mark 8, 
says at this particular point. And when I realize there is a failure on the part of adults to be discipled and to know how to disciple others, I'm challenged to think that we need to be building our lives upon the foundation of God's truth in such a way that not only will we be discipled and know how to think and live like a Christian, but we'll know how to disciple our children and our grandchildren and our neighbors and our business workers and so on. But I also realize as I read and, and, and interact with people and have over the years, how many of those people say, I want to do that, but I don't know how. Peter says we're to be able to give a reason to anyone who asks us why we believe what we believe. And yet I hear Christian people saying, I don't know how. I don't know how to tell someone or talk to someone about what I believe, to tell them about Jesus, though I'm trusting him for my salvation. Now, I don't know how you feel coming to St. Paul's week after week where the Bible is preached and taught regularly and faithfully. I hope you're encouraged by that because you can go to a lot of churches today where the Bible is hardly mentioned in, in the course of, of, of a worship service. But in hearing the Bible preached and taught, there are privileges and there are responsibilities that grow out of that. Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is required. Privileges and responsibilities growing out of hearing the word preached and hearing the word taught for yourself and for future generations. Now, now let me pose a question to you this morning. Actually, it's not my question. It's Jesus' question. The same question he asked twice in our text. And remember, he asked this, this, this question two times to his 12 disciples, those who were the closest to him during his ministry on earth. And the question is, do you understand? Do you understand? Understand what? Well, let's examine that and see what Jesus was asking. Think back over, I know I preached on this back in the summer, from Acts 8, the Ethiopian eunuch, who was traveling along in the desert and reading from a portion of Scripture, and he was struggling with that Scripture. He didn't know what it meant. And later, the evangelist Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I except someone show me? This is where we are. Even in the church, we hear the Word, we read the word, we may want to understand the word, but we're still not able to give a reason to anyone who asks us why we believe what we believe. And because we can't do that, we're very vulnerable to stepping into dualistic and pluralistic traps that Satan sets, uh, sets for us in our culture. Having had the privilege over recent years to teach hundreds of several hundred seminary students courses on making kingdom disciples, every time, and I continue to be amazed, that some of the students say, Dr. Donahue, why, why hadn't we heard about this in our churches? I don't know about the church. I don't understand it. I don't understand about the kingdom. And I couple what they ask with what I've observed in traveling about the church and realizing how few really understand what the church really is and what the kingdom is all about. And so as I worked through this passage, I came to the conclusion, wow, this is a frightening passage of Scripture that I read. And then I thought, should it be? 
Remember, the Ethiopian eunuch was reading his Bible. He was trying to understand what it was saying, but he couldn't put it together. And so God provided Philip the evangelist to go to the desert to meet with him and open the Scriptures and explain to him what that passage from Isaiah was all about. Now, our Westminster Standards, we read some questions while ago from there. Our Westminster Standards make it very clear that the Scripture is sufficient to speak to us, and it's perspicuous. But it's also clear, makes clear, that we need some help in understanding and applying that word to our lives. Now, in Mark's gospel, which I call the gospel of the kingdom, as a matter of fact, I wrote a book and a study uh, on the gospel of Mark called The Mystery of the Kingdom. The good news of the kingdom is the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we might call it. And in the 8th chapter, Jesus asked his disciples, in verse 17 and verse 21, the same basic question that Philip asked the Ethiopian eunuch. Except this time when Jesus asked the question, it was after the fact with the eunuch. The question was asked before Philip explained it to him. Now, to get the full importance of what Jesus is saying here, as always, you have to understand a text in its immediate context. But then you also have to understand it in its general context. And the immediate context, as I started reading, they just had just landed back in Galilee from having been gone for several months, I don't know exactly how many, to the northern regions of the territory. They had been in the Gentile part of the territory, Jesus preaching and teaching the kingdom of God, because the gospel is not just for the Jews, it's for everybody, those from every tongue, nation, tribe, and people. So Jesus and his 12 disciples had taken the gospel to the northern part among the Gentiles. And right before he left to come back to Galilee, Mark says he fed 4,000 people. It would be 4,000 plus, but 4,000 with seven loaves, uh, seven fish and a few loaves, or seven loaves and a few fish. That's what had just happened. Then they got in the boat and they came back to Galilee. And as they were approaching land, Mark says, the Pharisees, and I want you to picture this if you can. The Pharisees saw that boat coming into dock. And they ran up to Jesus. And right off the bat, they confronted Jesus. They started arguing with Jesus, and they demanded a sign that would show them who he is. And Jesus said, I'll not give you a sign. I'll not give you a sign. Now understand, the Pharisees in that confrontation was actually the personification of Satan. And why do I say that? Because Mark said they asked for a sign to test him or to tempt him. God doesn't test us. Satan is the tempter. So they asked him a sign to tempt him just like Satan did in the wilderness shortly after Jesus' baptism. Then it was in the form of a serpent. Here it's in the form of the Pharisees, the leaders of the Jewish religion. And Jesus did not give them a sign, just as he did not fall into the trap earlier in the wilderness. He refused to fall into the Pharisees' trap. No sign will be given. Of course, the interesting thing is, yes, a sign was given. Jesus was the sign. He was the sign for them. The sign that we just celebrated as we went through some of the passages during Christmas. Well, that's what happened. And then Mark says, immediately after saying that to the Pharisees and realizing they were out to trick him and tempt him. Mark says they got back into the boat. He and his 12 
closest disciples got back into the boat and they set sail back across the sea. Some of the commentators suggest that Jesus did that because he was exasperated or he was frustrated or he was irritated with these Pharisees. And we can understand that if that was really what happened, but that's not, what, that's not what's taking place here. You see, Jesus, at this point, knew something that even his 12 closest disciples had not understood. What was it? He asked them, do you understand what I know? So this passage is really all about Jesus seeing something and knowing something that his 12 closest disciples had not seen and had not known. And he wanted to deal with that, to teach them something in a way that they would understand it. So the 12 got back into the boat to sail to the other side. I don't know what time of day it was. I don't know what the weather was like. I don't know how far out to sea they got. But right off the bat, in the middle of that boat ride, came a terrible warning from Jesus. (laughs) And as he was doing that, the disciples We're thinking, you know what? We set sail and we didn't go to the grocery store. I don't have any bread. We only have one loaf of bread among the 12 of us and Jesus. Now, this is the third time in the Gospel of Mark, if you read through it, that Jesus has made a reference to bread. And every time there's a reference to bread, it's a revelation about something from God that he wants us to know and to do. They only had, once they said, they only had one loaf of bread on the boat. No, there were two breads on that boat. And that surfaced two concerns. First of all, the disciples were concerned that they didn't have any bread except one loaf, and they were hungry. Jesus had a different concern. And his concern manifested itself in the form of a warning to his 12 disciples. He said, watch out, guys. I'm warning you. By focusing on having only one loaf of bread, you're revealing something to me of what's in your heart and in your mind. And I'm telling you, you're in spiritual jeopardy because of that. Yes. You see, the twelve had been with Jesus. They had seen him perform miracles. They had listened to Jesus' teaching. They had walked with him in Galilee and on that circuitous journey to the north when he took the gospel to the Gentiles. And I think we could probably say that these 12 disciples at this point in the story are representative of people who have been with Jesus, who have heard his word preached, heard his word taught, who have seen miracles, uh, at least through the light of the word, and yet they still didn't understand what he was saying. They didn't understand what he was teaching. Could that really happen? Thus, Jesus asked this question. Do you not yet understand? Don't you get the picture? Well, what's it all about? What's going on here that makes this, I think, such a frightening passage of Scripture? As a matter of fact, as I've read and studied this, I might put it right alongside the unpardonable sin passage in Hebrews 6, or the warning about profaning the Lord's table in 1 Corinthians 11. 
Well, as, as we look at this scenario, I want you to realize this so you'll understand it. Jesus is using a parabolic style of teaching the 12 disciples at this point. It's a parable. That's important for you to understand. You see, Jesus taught about the kingdom of God using parables. And the, one of the reasons for using parables is, in a story form, is it's told in such a way that those who hear those stories have to respond to it in some way. You can't hear a parable and understand it without some response. Keep that in mind. This is a parable, parabolic story. And if you don't know how to respond to the story, you're going to miss the whole point. But right off the bat, the disciples had their priorities. <laughs> what were their priorities? Well, we're hungry. <laughs> and, and we forgot to bring bread. We only have one loaf of bread among the 12 of us. They contradicted themselves right off the bat. One loaf, one bread, or one bread, but there were actually two breads on that boat. See, they hadn't seen everything they were, they, they were supposed to see in that connection. They'd been with Jesus when he fed 5,000 people, 5,000 plus people, because most commentators agree that it was not just 5,000 people, but it was 5,000 people and their families, which could mean he fed as many as 15,000 with those five loaves and two fish. And he had 12 baskets left over. They had just seen him feed 4,000 Gentiles with seven loaves and a few fish, and they had seven baskets full left over. And now they're complaining and worrying and saying, we only have one loaf of bread among 12 of us. And so Jesus said, beware, guys. Be very careful. You're on the brink of committing the same sin that the Pharisees and Herod committed. He called it the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now, leaven, as you know, is yeast. And yeast is used to permeate flour to cause the bread to rise. Now, this is a side, but I think it's interesting. There are about 13 references to yeast and leaven in the New Testament. Only one of them is positive. The other 12 are negative. And that's because the rabbis back then used yeast as a, as a metaphor to underscore that every part of the life is evil. That We might call it total, total depravity today. So we know that Jesus, talking about the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of, of Herod, he wasn't talking positively to them about something. What was he saying? Well, if we, we let Scripture interpret Scripture, in Matthew 16, the yeast of the Pharisees refers to the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and Luke further explains it that they were hi hypocrites and what they were teaching. Now, let me remind you, Mark doesn't answer their question. Jesus' question, do you not yet understand? Keep that in mind. But so you and I will know how to process what's going on here. The yeast of the Pharisees is a reference to their hypocrisy, which can lead to hardening of the heart. Failing to believe that Jesus is the Christ, to see his kingdom, to confess him as their Lord and Savior. The yeast of Herod is a reference to Herod's double-mindedness. And so Jesus is saying to his disciples, guys, you're coming very close to committing the grievous sin of the Pharisees and of Herod. Because you do not see everything there is there. You have not yet, obviously, connected the dots. Your reality has not really encompassed me at the center of your life. 
they saw only one bread. But there were two breads on the boat. And as they were discussing this, Jesus heard them asking, and he said, why are you talking about having only one bread? And from that point on, he asked them a series of questions. Good way to teach. He said to them, do you not understand? Do you not see? Have you not heard? Having eyes, you do not see. Having ears, you do not hear. Don't you remember? You were with me when I fed those 5,000 plus people with those few breads and fish. And you were with me when I fed those 4,000 Gentiles with seven loaves and a few fish. Don't you understand? I am the bread of life. I am the miracle of life. You don't really know who I am, do you? You're with me, but you don't know who I am. You're talking about one loaf of bread, and you forget that I'm the other bread. I can feed many people with very little, Jesus is saying. You've heard my word, you've seen my miracles, and yet you do not yet understand who I am. Say a word to, to, to Jay Duff and his Christian Ed Committee. This is a great apologetic passage of Scripture to underscore the importance of Christian education and discipleship in the life of the church. It's a passage that speaks against easy believism. It's a passage that warns against someone who says, I believe in Jesus, but they haven't the foggiest understanding of what that means. You see, intellectual blindness, failure to understand, can be as deadening to our heart as the leaven was to the Pharisees and to Herod. Simple belief in Jesus doesn't work. It's got to be more than that. We have to add to our faith understanding. We have to understand what it means to say that we believe in Jesus. A faith without understanding, my friends, puts us in great spiritual danger. Jesus was the other bread. And if they had understood all that they had seen and heard previously, they would have known so what? We only have one loaf of bread. He can make multitudes of bread out of this one loaf. But as I said, their view of reality at this point in time had not really incorporated Jesus into their lives, like many Christians who say they believe in Jesus, but it makes no difference in the way they live every day because they don't really understand who he is. Now, how does Mark resolve this warning? As I told you, he doesn't. We learn as we read on in the Gospel of Mark later that the disciples did grow and they did come to understand more than certainly they demonstrated right here. But at this point, they had seen, they had heard, they had believed, but they had not understood. And Jesus warned them that they were in danger. They had not understood that God is the creator God. God is the God of the covenant family. They had not understood the creation and the fall into sin and redemption and the consummation being centered around the king and his kingdom. Jesus is the king, the Messiah. His kingdom has come. So he said no other signs will be given to this generation. You don't need it. It's here. I'm here. My kingdom is here. Now, you and I, as Christians, are, are instructed and called in the Scripture to be equipped, to be prepared, not only to give a reason to anyone who asks us why we believe what we believe, why we're Christians, 
but we're also to be able to know how to express that in the language of the people whom we may be witnessing to or talking to, and that requires some work. I thought about this. These 12 disciples had been with the master teacher of all times. They couldn't have had a better teacher. They had seen him flesh out his teachings in doing miracles. They had heard him say that the kingdom of God is present among you in every area of your life, and they had missed it. They had not yet understood that. And I guarantee you there are times in our lives when we don't know what it means to be a kingdom disciple. When we do not understand that Christianity is not a Sunday religion. It's a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week religion. You and I have the responsibility to know and understand what we believe, and we have, an understand, we have a responsibility to make that known to others. We're ambassadors for Christ. We're to be witnesses for Him. But we can't be satisfied with simply presenting the gospel in a way that says, all you need to do is trust Christ for your salvation, period. Because that's not the whole story. We can't tell people to simply believe and think that we fulfilled God's mission. They had to add to their belief understanding. I don't want to frighten you, but I want to tell you the truth. You and I as Christians are to be theologians. Now, not necessarily at the levels where we teach in college and seminary, but we're to study our religion. We're to know our faith. We're to be discipled in the Word. We're to be able to understand what Jesus wants us to understand and in such a way that we can pass it on to others. So Jesus asked His disciples, do you not yet understand? As I ask you today, do you not yet understand? who Jesus is, what his kingdom is all about. Friends, we need to connect the dots. We need to understand what we need to understand about our relationship to the Lord, our connection with Christianity, our membership in the church, our knowledge of the Word of God. Because if we understand it, if we connect those dots... It will lead us straight into the kingdom of God where we know that whether we eat or drink or watch television or spend time with my family or play golf or whatever, we're to do all to the glory of God because the Bible says what is not of faith is sin. Thinking about how to conclude this this week. I was doing the word study of understand in the Greek sentences. And I was taken back to one of Jesus' famous stories, another one of Jesus' famous parables. In Matthew 13, the the soil, the seed and the sower. He preached that lengthy parable, great passage of Scripture. And when he finished, and I want to follow Jesus' style, and I do try to, and I hope it's obvious. He didn't say to them, did you enjoy my sermon? Did I tickle your ears? What are you going to do about what I said? Instead, in Matthew 13, 13, verse 51, he said, when he finished his sermon, as I'm saying to you today, do you understand? That's my job to be as clear as I can to help you understand what it is that God wants you to know and understand. I'd like for you to enjoy my sermons, but that's not my motivation. I'm here to teach you, to help you understand. 
what God says. Now, I prepared a six-fold application of this. I'm not going to give it to you right now up here. But, but if you hear the challenge that's come through this text of Scripture to us, as you leave the sanctuary, there's a sheet of paper back on the table that has a six-fold process of how you can go about seeking to better your understanding of what I've talked about. If you want to do that, it's there to help you. Please don't settle for a simple faith. We live in too complex of a world to try to survive with simple faith in Jesus. We have to add to that faith, knowledge, and understanding. We have to be taught. We have to study the Word individually and singly. We have a great adult Sunday school class going on here now. You need to be here. If you have community Bible studies, you need to be there. You need to take every opportunity that you can to study the Word of God. But I better stop or I'm giving you my six-fold application. Let's pray. Father, help me not to minimize the importance of your word. Help me not to confuse and leave unchallenged those who hear. Father, this morning we want to be able to respond to your question. Yes, Lord, I understand and I believe. Help my unbelief. Help me to understand more and help me to be able to talk about that and to be able to give a reason to anyone who asks me why I believe in Jesus. That's what you require of us. That's what you expect of us. And we want to be equipped to do that. And assure us in the process as we trust you will do as we come to the table the great lengths you've gone to, to save us, to bring us into your kingdom, to make us personal members of your family. Father, we ask you to accomplish your purpose for this scripture this morning and bless us as we come to the table. Strengthen us and cause us to leave this church today more determined than ever to live for Jesus. Because we ask it together in his name, amen.